You're listening to the B&H Photography Podcast. For over 40 years, B&H has been the professional source for photography, video, audio, and more. For your favorite gear, news, and reviews, visit us at bnh.com or download the B&H app to your iPhone or Android device. Now here's your host, Alan Weitz. Greetings and welcome to the B&H Photography Podcast. As adventurous as it may sound, combat photography is not a Hollywood movie. Commercial photography might be competitive, but I don't think any photographer has ever been taken hostage or gone missing while jockeying for a good vantage point during Fashion Week or courtside at Wimbledon. Our guests today include Dr. Anthony Feinstein, a neuropsychiatrist and professor of psychiatry at the University of Toronto. He has authored a series of seminal studies exploring the psychological effects of conflict on journalists. He's the author of Journalists Under Fire, The Psychological Hazards of Covering War and Battle Scarred. In 2000, Feinstein was awarded a Guggenheim Fellowship to study mental health issues in post-apartheid Namibia. The 2012 documentary, Under Fire, based on his research of journalists in war zones, won a Peabody Award. His Globe and Mail newspaper series on conflict photography was shortlisted for a 2016 Epi Award, and today we will discuss his latest book, Shooting War. We're both pleased and honored to have you on the show today. Welcome. Also joining us today is Santiago Lyon. Santiago is the director of editorial content at Adobe and the former head of photo operations at the Associated Press. Under his direction, the AP won three Pulitzer Prizes photography in 2005, 2007, and 2013. As a photojournalist, he's covered conflicts in Latin America, the Balkans, Somalia, Yemen, Afghanistan, and other war zones, and he has paid the price for it physically, emotionally, and psychologically. Santiago is profiled in Anthony's book. Honored to have you here as well today. Thank you for joining us. We're going to start. We have a lot of things to talk about here today. And the first question uh, for you, Anthony, is really like five questions in one. We'll start with it and just roll into the rest. Can you discuss the research process and how long it took you to write the book? And and how did you choose your subjects uh, based on photos you admired or is it the personalities? Uh, And was there an overall goal to the project? Let's start with that. Yes. When you look at these very difficult images or these amazing images, you need to appreciate what the photographer went through to get the image to you. So that's that's the overall theme behind the book. Um, I've been looking at journalists researching the topic now for 18, 19 years. And over this period, I've got to meet a number of wonderful photographers like Santiago. Um, I have seen some remarkable images. I kind of file away images in my memory. I collect certain images as well. And the idea behind the book was to take an image from each photographer whom I admire and write about that photograph and what it took to get that photograph to the public. If I can ask, is there a a specific photograph or photographer that triggered this project? Because it seems that there are a lot lot of common themes going on here. You read this book and you have to put it down and pick it up again because yes. it's it's a lot to digest in one sitting. Exactly. Awful lot to digest. Yeah, it's not meant to be read, you know, from cover to cover in one in one setting. I think it's a cumulative effect. I you know, I've just in a sense gathered all this information over a long time and then, you know, going back retro- retrospectively decided this is a great photograph, this is an interesting person. So I kind of cherry picked from all this data that I've collected and said these 18 individuals um are fascinating people, they've done remarkable work, their photographs are, you know, compelling, they've got stories to tell, and that became the basis for the book. Uh, now, are you, if I just one fast thing, is it the photographs that trig- that that first got you interested in, or was it a story of a particular journalist that first gave you the seed for this project? The majority is a photograph. You kind of look at this image, it's a compelling image. Okay. Um, so I would say overall it was a photograph, but along the way I do meet some really interesting people and then you go in search of their photographs. So it kind of cut both ways. But I think on balance it was more the photograph and I worked backwards from the photograph. Interesting. Mm-hmm. Not always the the most well-known photo by some of these photographers, though. Is that true? Uh, it, it seems to be that you, you, you wanted to pick a photo that demonstrated... Uh, their work and and perhaps uh, what they suffered. Yeah, yeah, excellent. I yeah. mean, that's that's exactly it. I mean, right. it's a photograph that resonated with me, right. and I thought that would tell a story. Mm-hmm. And it didn't always turn out to be the you know the the most famous photograph. In some cases, it did with Don McCullen, right. but with other photographers, no. Right. Yeah. Right. And the book is kind of a hybrid, no? Wouldn't you say? I mean, it has 
has elements of a, of a photo book. You know, there are photos in it. I mean, were there a lot of decisions going back and forth as to whether you would include photos, whether you would include more photos? Um, yes. Can you speak about that process? It was, absolutely. Yeah. And, and I was very clear that I just wanted one photograph per journalist. Mm -hmm. um, the, the, the publisher was thinking about, well, let's have multiple photographs. But I think, you know, the, there are a lot of photography books out there right. with, with, with lots of photographs of, of, of you know, more photographers. This is a different kind of book. Mm -hmm. I didn't want um, I didn't want the photographs to overwhelm the reader. There's a single image. You can focus on the single image and then go and read the text. And I think that holds it together in a much more cohesive way than having things dispersed with multiple photographs, multiple topics, etc. I think yeah, you, I think you would dilute the whole project if you had multiple pictures. It would turn it into a photo book, and that's an important thing to to note. Is that John and I were talking earlier. So this is a hard book to classify. It's not uh, reportage. It's not a photo book. It's kind of hard to pick out. But once you get started, it's very hard to leave it. Yeah, I think I think the theme behind it is what I said at the beginning is that it's a it's a um, examination of great photojournalists and the difficulties that they confront with their work and the price that they pay to bring us these images. That, to me, is the unifying theme over here. Can you talk a little bit about, or if you noticed, any particular characteristics that threaded through all the photographers? I mean, obviously, we, we talk about, you know, risk-taking and things like that, but there must be, there's a whole lot that go into making a great photojournalist. Well, well, for me, the intriguing part is that and, and Santiago will speak to this, that you can s sustain this career for such a long time doing mm -hmm. such difficult work. Mm -hmm. So I think that in itself is very unusual because as I you know, began to appreciate this group of individuals, I could see that they spend more time in zones of conflict than just about anybody else. Um, you know, Many journalists have said to me that they have more experience of conflict than soldiers, mm -hmm. that they've been doing it for decade after decade. And, and different conflicts and around different the world. Conflicts. Right. Yeah, you know, a soldier has a tour of duty and then goes home and mm -hmm. maybe two tours of duties and that's it. But this is a group of individuals who've done it for you know, 20, 30 years, in some cases longer than that. So the, the cumulative exposure to, to war and conflict, I think, is almost unrivaled. Mm -hmm. um, and I think you've got to be a certain kind of person to sustain that. And and what? Yeah, what that kind was my person. Yeah, what being? kind of person? Well, yeah, <laughs> that, that 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 that's the intriguing part. I mean, yeah. there, there's going to be no you know easy answer. You can't break it down to to one variable. But I mm -hmm. I believe that to do this work for a long time, you have to have a certain biology. Mm -hmm. You've got to um, not necessarily feel comf comfortable in dangerous places, but you've got to be able to endure an enormous mm -hmm. amount of stress and danger mm -hmm. and maintain clarity. Exactly. In real time. Exactly. You can't think about stuff. Well, I think, you know, it all comes together that the, that the individuals who can do this, who have this, this kind of biology, are able to think with clarity in very difficult circumstances, that they don't become overwhelmed by, uh, by a crushing fear response, for example. And there's a very strong um, neuroscience literature on the biology of novelty seeking, of risk taking. And I don't think this is predominantly a risk taking motivation, but this is very dangerous work and uh, to function and do it effectively, you do have to have a certain biology, particularly if it's, you want to sustain your career over decades. And then you get into this really intriguing discussion on things like dopamine, dopamine levels, what awakens your dopamine. Um, you look at things like epigenetics, how does your genetic material interact with the environment and in turn how is it affected by the environment, what are your neurotransmitters like. And when you put that whole package together, we know that a large chunk of this is controlled by one's genes, one's heritability. And so you know, when we look at temperament, this, which is what we're talking about over here, a large chunk of our temperament comes from our genetic makeup, but it's not purely reductionistic. You can't say it's all genes. Yes, the genes are very important. They determine our biology. They determine our enzyme levels and our neurotransmitter levels to a high degree, but you've got all these other factors that are going to make up the rounded picture of why people do this, such as you're skilled with a camera, you write very well, you're intrigued by history, you're fascinated by these dramatic events unfolding in front of you, you're motivated to tell stories, you're compelled to bear witness, you want to give voice to the people who are dispossessed. So these are things that I've heard you know, time and time again from the journalists, and, and these are very powerful motivating factors. But I think by themselves are not enough. You've got to be hardwired 
to allow you to do this. Well, can I ask then, I mean, in your research and in your experience, and maybe Santiago, you can chime in on this, have you come across photographers or photojournalists who, who don't demonstrate this or maybe are naturally risk averse or, or terrified before they went in, but it was either a, you know, a moral outrage or a need to tell a story that they, they, they force themselves time and time again to overcome this to, uh, to get out there and shoot? I, I mean, I don't, I don't think, and, and, and Santi will speak to this, I mean, I don't think this is an absence of fear. I mean, I think there mm -hmm. can be very real fear. Sure. I think fear is protective. But the, the, the part is, how do you sustain this? Mm. I mean, I've come across a lot of journalists who've said to me, oh, they want to be a war reporter. And they go into their first war and they just, they can't, they can't stomach it. Mm -hmm. You know, they, they're just completely overwhelmed by what they confront and never go back. This group's different. I mean, you know, they, you, 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 they, they feel the same emotions, but they... They overcome that and they go back repeatedly. Right. And I think to be able to do that, you've got to be wired in a certain way, just like the individuals who climb the high mountains who go back. And um, the high mountaineers will tell you that they do whatever they can to try and minimize risk. Mm -hmm. And I believe that's the case with the Santiago's profession as well. But there are going to be variables that you can't control, right? Mm -hmm. Even and is this this myth of the you know the cowboy? Is this the cowboy photojournalist who's out there taking risks? Something that we just is a Hollywood story. I mean, do you, in your experience, see the widest range of personalities and people out there doing this kind of work? Um, you know, I think for a lot of people, it's a very um, for a lot of people, it seems very glamorous and it seems very exciting. And it's been stereotyped to some degree, either through Hollywood movies or novels or, you know, the sort of the persona. And the press themselves certainly and have done their, yeah. their original. Yeah, yeah. So there's this sort of persona that exists in people's imaginations that is very exciting. And you get a lot of young photographers coming and saying, I want to do that. I want to be a war photographer. And you start to ask their motivation. And some of them have it quite clear what's driving them and why they want to do it. But many of them, at least initially, can't describe it beyond wanting to do something exciting. Mm. And so when I was working at the AP as the director of photography there, I had scores of young photographers coming to see me, uh, clamoring to be sent to dangerous places. And I would always tell them, no, I didn't think it was a good idea. No, maybe you should go do something else as a way of sort of separating the people who were truly determined from the ones who were sort of a little more fickle, perhaps. And you could gradually wean it down to individuals who seem to have the right motivation. And what were those, um, I mean, in, and at the time of these interviews and you're speaking to the photographers, what were the motivations that would, would sink to you and say, hey, that, that's the person I want out there? What would tip the scale? I think it, it was a combination of the motivation and the personalities involved. So looking for some of the things that Anthony has talked about in terms of resilience, in terms of the ability to concentrate under difficult circumstances, in terms of uh, being very passionate, uh, being very determined, um, the sorts of individuals who, over the course of maybe an hour's conversation, you could begin to sense that they might have uh, what it takes to do that kind of work. But then the other thing that was important um, in that process was making sure that these individuals were aware of the psychological hazards involved and had some understanding of the psychological cost of doing that sort of work. And how do you approach that? How do you get into that conversation with these people? Well, you know, in journalism, of course, you get the answers to the questions you ask, which <laughs> seems like a, yeah, a, okay. a truism, <laughs> but it's true. And so, you know, as a lifelong journalist, I was able to sit down with people and very quickly establish a rapport, build up some trust, and then start to ask questions that were somewhat unusual. Um, in terms of, you know, why do they want to do this? Tell me about yourself. Tell me about your family. Tell me about your background. And starting to get, take somebody's measure. And if you do that enough, and that's an integral part of journalism, I believe, sort of building trust, if you do that enough with enough people, you begin, or I found that one could develop a, a fairly well-honed sense of character and motivation but then the other part of it is, you know, you didn't necessarily want to throw somebody with no experience into the middle of a hazardous situation. And so 
There's a sort of a well-worn path, I would say, where um, photographers start at sort of lower level stressful situations. So maybe that involves covering a demonstration or a riot or something where sort of chaos breaks out. And the photographers themselves begin to get a sense of what they're made out of. And so once they've sort of proven themselves in those areas, it becomes easier to see what they're going to be capable of and then gradually you could start to send them into the sort of the, the bigger, tougher stories. And, and as an editor, did you make those decisions a lot to say, okay, you know what, I don't think you're quite ready, I want you to do this and yeah. then come back to me in a year and we'll talk? And, and Yeah, it was very much a, uh, you know, it was like um, a lot of time was spent developing people. Mm -hmm. And one of the reasons for that, of course, um, is because typically after a certain amount of time, people's change, their situation in life changes, their bodies physically change in terms of their, their brain and their, the physiology of their, of their brain and their psychology and all that. And so after a time you found, you found, after a time you found experienced journalists who'd had enough yeah. uh, and who wanted to go do something else. And so there was a sort of a, a practical need to replace those people hmm. over time. And so what I found at, at some stage, I think, in a, you know, around the time of the Libyan Revolution, if I recall correctly, we had sent in a stream of AP photographers to cover that story, and it was becoming harder to find people because the usual um, individuals who we would count on for those stories uh, collectively were no longer interested mm. because they had matured or their lives had they'd had children or they wanted to or, or they just the got they had covered the or they got Iraq tired and Afghanistan or psychologically or tired or, or physically tired or, or whatever so we had to identify a whole new group of people to take their place mm. and you know initially it's quite a daunting proposition in the sense that you're identifying younger less experienced people you're training them, giving them experience, giving them equipment, giving them training, and preparing them for war, knowing that in all likelihood, 5, 10, 15, 20 years down the road, those individuals were also going to want to go do something else. Mm -hmm. So I found that a little bit disturbing initially until I became more aware of the fact that we weren't forcing these people to do this. Mm -hmm. This was very much a volunteer mm -hmm. uh, operation, and the people who we were sending to these stories, we were sending them because we felt they were capable, but also because they wanted to go mm -hmm. there. Can I ask you maybe to look back uh, on your on your own career as a journalist? Do you can you talk about your motivations when you, when you started and and as they evolved and changed? Uh, sure. Okay. So I um, I started in this business very young. Um, I got out of high school and decided to take a gap year, and I'm still on that gap year <laughs> 35 years later. There's no rush. Uh, no rush. Yeah, I might go back to university at some point. Um, <laughs> and so in my gap year, I started working uh, as a translator for uh, a Spanish news agency um, that w was producing a service of stories from Central America and we're talking here in the mid um, 1980s when you know Central America was was on fire with insurgencies and all sorts of, of stuff going on, El Salvador, uh, Honduras, Guatemala, Nicaragua, all those countries. And so, as a young man, I was reading these stories and translating them from Spanish to English, and I was amazed at the stories that I was reading. You know, the stories of guerrillas and insurgencies and massacres and rape and pillage and bombardments. It seemed unbelievable to me that this was actually happening. But I know it was. And at that point, I said to myself, well, this is incredible. I have to go see this with my own eyes. Hmm. And one of my older colleagues said, kid, if you want to see that stuff up close, you should become a photographer because they get to see everything. And so I bought a camera from an AP photographer and began to learn the process at that time. This is obviously pre-digital. And so there was a whole sort of almost artisanal process of developing film and making prints and writing captions on typewriters and sending <laughs> pictures down telephone lines. And, you know, compared to what we have today, it was, it's a, it was a very slow process. Back then it was 
state of the art. And so I learned that trade, if you like, over the course of a couple of years. And it became clear that um, I had an eye, a photographic eye, and I had the, the gumption to, to do it. Mm -hmm. And so I finally ended up in Central America. It took me um, five years, four or five years to, to do that, but I finally ended up in Central America. Were you covering news, regional, local news in, was this in, in Madrid. In no, Madrid. I, was, in Madrid. Okay. I, I was in Madrid at that time, and I was covering, yeah, sports events, uh, politics. And were you chomping at the bit to get, I mean, what, was it this kind of desire to see the worst that people can do or, or the, the most important news events of the day? I felt that I was preparing myself to some degree. I mm -hmm. felt that I was learning a trade because of the nature of the work. It was very methodical. You had to learn all of these things. It wasn't just taking a picture and that was it. There was mm -hmm. the whole delivery of the pictures and all of that. And then in the course of that day-to-day -day work in Spain covering, you know, the events of a major European capital, um, I was exposed to a certain amount of violence through demonstrations that were happening at the time, student demonstrations, riot police, tear gas, rubber bullets, all that sort of stuff. And it was a great training ground. And I found that I was able to really get up close and stay focused and concentrate and make, you know, quite effective photographs in the middle of all this chaos. Mm -hmm. And so between that and the sort of the training uh, of all the other things that I needed to do, I, w I felt that I was uh, ready for, for that work in Central mm -hmm. America. So I finally ended up there in 1989, age 23, uh, running the photo operations for Reuters news agency for Mexico and Central America. I mean, like way out of my league. <laughs> but uh, it was the beginning of 10 years of pretty much um, continuous coverage of war and conflict, not exclusively, because working for the wire services, you're also expected to photograph other things as mm -hmm. well. You're mm -hmm. expected to be a generalist, although you might have a specialty. And did you love what you were doing at the time? I and mean, was it, could you imagine yourself doing something else? Was it, was it, I mean, what was the, I mean, you may have been very good at it, but did you love it? Yeah, I loved it. I couldn't believe my luck. Uh -huh. I mean, I, I couldn't believe that I was being paid to go out and be a witness to history and have a very privileged access and really be seeing history as it was being made and making pictures. And I think the other big motivation for me was I had always been aware of the power of journalism in the sense that it reaches so many people. Mm -hmm. And especially working for the news agencies, my father had been a, a news agency reporter for many years. And I had seen you know, his stories and the stories of his colleagues printed in newspapers around the world. And I became aware of the sort of magnifying power of working for a news agency mm -hmm. by dint of the worldwide distribution. And so I sort of at some point set myself a a kind of a bar that said, if just one person is affected in some meaningful way by my work, then I've done my job. Mm. And I knew that because I was distributing my pictures through the AP or Reuters at that time, but in any case to hundreds of media outlets around the world, I knew that that was happening. Yeah. And that for me was a big motivator um, to carry on and to keep doing it. And the violence and, and how did you deal with that? Did, did that become... Well, you tell me. Uh -huh. You know, at some point I realized that all of this was taking its toll. Mm -hmm. um, I, I knew that there was something wrong with me um, in the sense that I was not sleeping well. I was having intrusive memories. Mm -hmm. I was uh, depressed. I was something. Did you notice this in the early years? I noticed that around 1992 following my first trip to the Balkans, to, okay. the, to, the, to Bosnia and to the siege of Sarajevo. Mm -hmm which was the first um, sort of organized war that I had covered in the sense that it involved fixed positions and heavy weaponry and, and that up until that point in Central America, it had been mainly guerrilla warfare, you know, mm -hmm. small arms warfare, intense and dangerous, but quite different from, from what was happening in the Balkans. And so after I came back from my first trip to the Balkans, which in itself was pretty uh, horrific, uh, we had a colleague killed, we had a colleague wounded, I'd seen all kinds of horrible stuff. I came back from that trip in 1992, 
and began to realize that something had changed in me and that I wasn't right. Mm. And I remember going to see a psychiatrist in London and being diagnosed in 1992 with PTSD or at least a number of its component parts. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And um, it was like, oh, okay, so now I understand why I'm feeling like this, but I didn't take the next logical step which would have been to seek some help and mm -hmm. <laughs> to do some yeah. therapy and talk to somebody about it and, and address it. Mm -hmm. Instead, I just kind of filed that away as a data point mm -hmm. and carried on. Right. And carried on um, for the next seven years um, without doing any of that therapy. And, you know, I think to some degree that stuff is cumulative. And I remember just sort of dealing with it putting it aside, focusing on the work, becoming more and more detached from my emotions, becoming more and more detached from these difficult emotions and feelings I was having mm. and just focusing on the work. And the work got better and better mm. and you know, the recognition that came with the work and the prizes and the sort of level of prominence and, you know, becoming well known for that sort of work and doing it to a very high level, that became the focus. Right, right. Until Sounds almost like an addiction in a sense. Yeah, I think it is an addiction. Um, what is it an addiction to? It's an addiction to, you know, the compelling nature of the work. Um, I think adrenaline has a component there, certainly, but it's not exclusively adrenaline. You know, you never feel, in my experience, as alive as when your life is in danger. And in to some degree, I, I began, and I realized this later, that to replicate those feelings of, of feeling alive and feeling vital usually in ordinary life, those come about with things of great significance like having children maybe or getting married or having great professional success. You can feel fulfilled and feel very much alive. In the war zone, you feel very much alive just by dint of being there. Mm. And so it's sort of like the, 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 your body is vibrating constantly and it's very compelling and... I would say it's also somewhat escapist yeah. in the sense that you don't have to deal with the mundane problems of everyday life. You know, you'd be on the phone and uh, my colleagues would, would, I remember I would see them, you know, they'd get off the phone very agitated. They'd just been talking with their partner or their wife back in Paris or London who was complaining about the washing machine being right. broken or, you know, the electricity being uh, something, you know, domestic problems. And by being in a, in a conflict zone, you were able to avoid all of that. Mm -hmm. So there was a certain of avoidance factor to it combined with this overwhelming intensity, combined with the feeling that you were doing something meaningful, combined with the fact that you were showing the whole world what was going on. So mm -hmm. it was a kind of a very potent cocktail of sure. circumstances that was very compelling. Mm -hmm. And of all of the profiles I read in the book, I didn't read all of them, but I read many of them, it seemed that inevitably each of these photographers hit the point that you did. With There was a wall. Either yeah. First they had to recognize it and then they had to deal with it. Is there anybody who has, in either of your experiences, not hit that wall? Well, you know, it's not, it's not black and white. I mean, oh, yeah. um, you know, the, various, the mm -hmm. various gradations here. I think not every journalist who does this work gets PTSD. Um, not everybody becomes depressed. Um, I mean, New Jersey Transit can do that to you also, but this is a whole different ball game here. Exactly. And, you know, everything in my profession in psychiatry lies along a continuum from, you know, mild to severe. And so you will get you know, numerous variations on how people adjust to it. But my sense is that everybody is affected by what they do because it's such powerful, compelling work and what you see is so remarkable. So people will respond to that in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, I think everybody responds to it in a positive way. Um, the downside of it is that you do leave yourself open to getting hurt physically, and some people get very bad, inju very bad injuries. 
um, there is the heightened risk of PTSD, but you know it's a mistake to think that the, the whole profession has PTSD because they don't. Mm-hmm. Um, you're going to be at risk for depression, you know, relative to the general population, but not everybody's depressed. So, there, you know, there, there are multiple uh, you, possibilities here. Can you talk a little bit about? Uh, I don't know if this is your you coined this phrase, but moral injury and. Uh you know, distinguish it from PTSD and... and yes, I, yeah. I didn't, I didn't, that's not my term, okay. but, but, but moral injury is something that the military have known about for a long time. Mm-hmm. You know, the s- soldiers would come back from the war in Iraq and feel that uh, they'd been told one thing before they went and then they'd get there and confront a different reality and mm-hmm. they'd felt somehow that they had betrayed their moral compass, that they'd done things that were wrong and then they come back home and they feel guilty about what they've done. I mean, moral injury is linked to two predominant emotions which are guilt and shame and it arises from a sense of you feel you've transgressed your moral compass that you've done something that was morally wrong or in the case of journalists maybe your news organization has not behaved in a morally acceptable way or your colleagues haven't behaved in a morally acceptable way and that can affect you uh, and leave you feeling very distressed but it's not a mental illness Mm -hmm. that's very Mm -hmm. important it's not a mental illness but it can cause distress and evidence shows that if it's not dealt with that can become a conduit to something like PTSD or depression. Mm. Um, what's interesting is that the study that we did a year back in Europe, looking at journalists covering the waves of migration arriving in Europe, um, we didn't find high rates of PTSD in this group or, or depression, but we found quite a lot of moral injury. Mm. And you can you can quantify mm. this. There's a, there's a rating scale for it. And, um, and the moral injury arose because of the nature of the decisions that they had to make. Um, and they were, they, they were, they were, they were, this could arise in multiple ways. Um, they would be on a beach and, and refugees would arrive, would arrive and the refugees couldn't swim. So what do you do? Do you wait in to try and save them or do you take the photograph? And if you're waiting to, to save someone, who do you save? Do you save the child or the adult? Or if it's a child, which child? Because there's more than one. And then once you've saved someone and you're on the beach and there are no aid workers around, then what do you do? Right. You put someone in a car and drive them to a hospital, but you can't put everyone in your car because they're too many. So who do you choose? And then people are thirsty, so who do you give water to? So, so you're kind of making these decisions all the time. Every choice leads to more choices that are harder and exactly. harder to deal with. Exactly. You know, and it's the old saying that you know, the road to damnation is paved with good intentions. You, 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 you know, your heart is in the right place, but you, you know, you you you, you can't you can't. Um, satisfy everybody and that was very very difficult for journalists and then there would be the pressures from the newsroom back home they you know the newsroom wants the picture taken they want the story told but the journalist feels that maybe they have to put their camera down and do something whereas the competition doesn't so the Mm -hmm. other person gets the scoop and they don't and then there's going to be fallout from that so you can start seeing how these things play out the whole time and that was very difficult for the journalist. And Santiago, what would you say to a photographer who who came back and said, "I, I didn't get the photo. I had I had to go into the water and and and, and put my camera down." Um, I think you would praise them for being good moral people. I mean, at the end of the day, we're people before we're anything. Mm-hmm. I had a couple of experiences in Bosnia where I took people to the hospital. I remember taking an old lady to the hospital who'd been wounded in the street. I remember taking a young child for the same reason. And, you know, that was the priority. And I made the mistake the first time of telling my bosses uh, back in New York that Hmm. that's what I'd done. And they were quite upset with me because at that time, from their perspective, they thought that journalists should not participate in stories and we should just be neutral observers. Boy, that's a tall order. Yeah. So, I mean, things have changed. I think there's more understanding now, uh, perhaps, in some areas. But I remember after that, I just determined that I was going to continue to behave in what I thought was a, you know, upstanding way, and I just wasn't going to talk about it to my bosses. Mm. And was that something you were able to sustain throughout all the years you were doing that? Yeah. I mean, there's always a balance, you know, if there are trained professional people on site, mm. then you should probably get out of the way and let them do let their them job. Do their job yeah. But in the absence of those individuals, when somebody needs help, mm. you give them help. Right. And you profile in your book a few photographers who saw something uh, then, and they didn't react or, or they didn't intervene uh, and that became maybe, you know, the, the beginning of a, a life change for them where they then would intervene off, or in some cases refused to intervene. I, I imagine you, you, you came across that a lot, no? Yeah, I mean, I think there was this, um, well, there is this French photographer, Laurent Chez, mm-hmm. who um, 
feels compelled to, to intervene repeatedly in very dangerous situations. Right. And so when she was working in the Central African Republic, um, where there were militia roaming around, you know, killing people from different ethnic groups, and she would arrive um, at the scene of, you know, one of these these killings, um, she felt compelled to try and stop it, which was extremely hazardous to her. And other mm -hmm. journalists would tell her, "Don't do this. Mm -hmm. This is this is this is very dangerous. You're putting yourself at at a very high risk." And you know, her response was, "If I don't do it, I don't feel good about myself." Mm -hmm. And this is an attitude that she brings back to her work in Paris, where she films, you know, migrants and refugees who end up in, in Paris and she feels compelled to help them financially or in one case put someone up in a hotel mm. overnight. And so she, she she just feels this moral imperative to do this, which is understandable, um, but it's never enough because mm -hmm. the need is so great. Mm. I wonder if, and this is a bigger question than we can all answer, but with that is is photography and photojournalism the right job for her in the sense that if if her, her goal primarily is to help as many people as possible, uh, if there could be other outlets for that. And, well, I think she also feels that she helps people with her photographs because she gets the news out and she you know she tells a story with 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 her photographs. Mm -hmm. But along the way, when you do these this work, you come across all this this human misery, and yeah. so. Um, that, that, that that's where the moral dilemma comes in. Absolutely. Yeah. Well, it seems like she struck a balance that seems to be working for her for the most part. Well, well it's intriguing because many of her more experienced colleagues say to her that she's gone too far. Uh, you know, so when she's on the scene in a place like the Central African Republic where you know, civil society has collapsed and the moral order has broken down, you know, she's the one person who puts herself between this child who's going to get killed uh, and 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 the, the child safety and there's there, there's no other there's no other barrier there's no one to save her she's not she's working alone she doesn't have her security details she's she's just out her, there she's just yeah mm. we're going to take a short break and we come back with more with Anthony Feinstein and Santiago Lyon stay tuned we hope you're enjoying this edition of the B and H Photography Podcast. Send us a tweet at bh photo video hashtag bh photo podcast. Okay, we are back. Something I, I wanted to ask about: um, we're talking about post traumatic uh, uh, syndromes and the way a lot of these photographers and, and soldiers get hit by this stuff. This is traumatic stuff and it's hard to pull out of it. Um, I, I once had an interesting conversation with a psychiatrist and um, she was talking about that. And she said that there's a, there's a flip side of that too. And she called it post-traumatic growth syndrome in which people who have been through serious, heavy traumatic experiences rather than crash haven't actually used it as a place to build from. It gave them a new perspective and they grow from that. How often have you seen this happen where photographers have been in conflict and, and I read it repeatedly here where they, ultimately you crash. How many people have actually been able to take this thing and actually use it as a growth tool and build and shoot from there? Well, I'm aware of the post-traumatic growth literature uh, and, and undoubtedly it does occur with some people, um, but I think you've got to be very careful on viewing this as a you know, as trauma as a positive phenomenon. I mean, most people suffer dreadfully from PTSD. Mm -hmm. um, yes, it can be treated and it can be overcome. But it doesn't mean that, you know, from there you're going to move on to being a stronger, better person. But some people can. That's yes, what, that's, can. that's what I was being told. And that's what I'm questioning. Have you seen it? Yes, I have. But, I, you know, I think it's a minority who are able to do that. I think this is the kind of difficulty that brings people down very hard mm -hmm. and um, not everybody recovers from it and those who do can be left with an enduring vulnerability and then there will be that smaller group who can grow from an experience like this and you know emerge with a greater resilience and maybe even take their life in a new direction that will be very fulfilling and very creative mm -hmm. but in my experience that's going to be a minority yeah but it's you know it's like people who survive cancer Right, and they come out of it, and this is a life-changing phenomenon, and they view the world differently, and their relationships change. I see this all the time in medicine, that you know, people who are suddenly visited by a very nasty ailment, whether it's PTSD or cancer or traumatic brain injury, um, their lives fundamentally change. Mm -hmm. You know, when people come to me and say, "I want to go back to being the kind of person that I was before," that's often a very unrealistic Ooh, expectation yeah. because even if you 
survive it and you recover from it and you do well with therapy, the process itself changes you. I can speak to that a little bit. I think over the course of my career, when I was working as a photographer, I probably lost a dozen or so colleagues uh, killed. Um, some of them I knew quite well. Some of them were just sort of casual acquaintances. But I could look at a list and say, I knew that person, I knew that person, I knew that person. And uh, in the year 2000, a Spanish cameraman working for the AP, uh, Miguel Gil Moreno, was killed in Sierra Leone with Kurt Shork, a well-known Reuters uh, reporter. And that for me was like the end. I said, okay, I'm not doing this anymore. Uh, the, you know, Miguel was a good friend of mine and I thought, I've had enough, my glass is full. I had all the psychological baggage that I'd been carrying for the previous six or seven years. I had been wounded, I had just been through the ringer. And so I decided to stop. And I thought to myself, well, this will be easy. I'll stop and that'll be that. And of course, it wasn't easy. And the next two years were without doubt the most difficult years of my life. Not because I was in danger, but because I had a profound identity crisis. You were a fish out of water. I was flopping around. Yeah. I didn't know who I was. I had lost my identity combined with all the psychological baggage that had accumulated. And so I went through a very, very dark time. And I was lucky in that I was able to take a year off work, go do a fellowship, go do all the mental laundry um, that had you know, been accumulating and then reinvent myself in a completely different role running, you know, a global photo operation, hundreds of people working for me, multi-million dollar budgets, very exciting and compelling and meaningful work, but not life-threatening, at least not to me. And so I was able to reinvent myself. And I, you know, I, I think one is always developing and one is always growing. But I think it's important to recognize that your life experiences form part of you and you have to accept that. And if you've had difficult times and gone through difficult things, you have to come to terms with that. And it's not easy and, you know, not everybody can do it. Not everybody is lucky enough to be able to do it. But I'd like to think that I am and was and, and I'm carrying on, you know, continuing to do meaningful stuff just in a different way. Off of that, I mean, do you, the difference... What kind of differences do you feel in terms of sending somebody else into harm's way as That's opposed to yourself curious. going into harm's yeah. way? And, and harm's yeah, way. I, and that was, you know, that was another blow, I think. When I, when, I took, um, when I took the job to run the AP photo department, my biggest fear was that somebody on my watch was going to get killed. And, um, you know, in a big organization like that, you do what you can to minimize the risk. You give people training, you develop people professionally, you give them safety equipment, you plot out their movements, you do, you do everything that you can. But as we know, in war situations, there's bad luck. You run into the wrong person, bad stuff can happen. And so it was in 2014, uh, you know, I got a phone call informing me that somebody working for me had been killed in Afghanistan who happened to be um, a good friend of mine, the German photographer Anja Niedringhaus. And so that really marked, that, that incident really became the sort of the end of um, my sort of, what am I trying to say here? That, that incident was so upsetting to me because it had confirmed my worst fears that after that I sort of became disengaged from the job and a couple of years later I went and did something else. Okay. Um, hmm. But you knew that that was gonna, it, it was inevitable that something like this is going to happen in such a large organization covering so many kind of conflicts. Yeah, the chances... You actually had a good run, I would say. Yeah, I had 10 years, Yeah, and then it happened. And in the meantime, other stuff had happened. You know, people had been blown up, people had been abducted, all kinds of stuff, but nothing like that. Okay. So I had a good run, but, you know, it caught up. Can you speak a bit to... Maybe I'll ask this to, to Santiago and then Anthony. The first one is um, a bit about the, the camaraderie amongst journalists, photographers, especially when you're in, in war zones. Uh, does that serve... 
as a way to to ease the pain and make it easier, or does that end up becoming competitive, or is you just all too focused on on what you're doing that that friendships? Uh, how, how does that help when you're in these situations? I think it helps. I think there's a real camaraderie there. Uh, shared risk um, often draws people together. Mm-hmm. Um, and I've noticed it as the years have gone on, like as the friendships have lasted, you know, I'm in touch with maybe a couple dozen people still who, with whom I shared experiences over the years. And I would say our bonds are very strong. But at the time, were, were, was it a, a way to maintain your, yeah, your health be- and your sanity? I, I think I think it helped because mm-hmm. people who have shared those experiences understand what you're talking about. Yeah. And it's difficult to explain what you've been through to somebody who hasn't been there. Yeah. Um, you don't. You either don't have the, the 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 means to describe it accurately, or they don't have the means to understand what you're saying, or some combination of the two. And so, you know, you'd be telling people profound stuff about your life, and you, if they hadn't been there, if they didn't have an understanding of what was involved, you'd see them sort of switch off and lose interest. It was too much for them. Because for most people, you know, who have everyday, ordinary lives, those sorts of experiences are unimaginable. Well, it's interesting. Last week, the episode we had was on flight 1549, the flight that went down the Hudson and everybody walked off the plane. And um, that was a common theme too. These were 150 strangers that now have a bond that will never be broken. There are some very strong friendships that have come through that, and they get together often in groups, large groups and small, but that's apparently part of their story is that, no, we have family now that we never knew we had, and they are bonded to these people because they went through an experience that is just so unique, and I imagine it's just parallel to what a war or conflict photographer would be going through, anybody through that kind of an experience. Yeah, I think that's true. Anthony, my question: Did you do you notice uh, any more than you would in the general populace uh, um, using self medication, alcohol, and drugs as a, as a way to deal with these problems, or, or the, the PTSD, or even while in while enduring these? Yeah, I mean, it's, it's very common in the general population for people to self medicate their distress. I see this all the time in my clinical practice. Um, and by the way, I mean the big the big the big push now in Canada is everybody wants cannabis because suddenly the drug is you know not not. It's legal now, so people, you know, they, they want the drug. Um, but that, that's a well-described phenomenon that people who are depressed or anxious um, self-medicate with alcohol, drugs, combinations of, of the above. And that's, you know, very self-destructive. I mean, alcohol is a very bad medicine. I mean, it's great in social circumstances, but, you know, if you can't sleep, alcohol is not a good hypnotic. It's a central nervous system depressant. It makes things worse. And so I've certainly come across that in journalists, but you see it quite commonly in the general population sure. as well. Yeah. And, and Santiago, would you say that that was, a, like, was there this this image that we have of, you know, the, the, the craziness of the day and then back to, to the hotel at night where it just continues in that vein? Or So for the longest time in journalism, there was no real recognition of post-traumatic stress disorder or the psychological fallout from doing that kind of work. And so typically problems were sort of dealt with at the bar Mm. or, you know, through drugs or whatever it was. And there was a culture among journalistic leadership that sort of demanded resilience and had no time to hear what journalists were going through. And it was Anthony, in fact, and maybe he can talk about this a little bit later, was a pioneer in the field of describing the relationship between trauma and journalism. There had been much literature written about the relationship between trauma and the military Mm -hmm. and first responders and all those sorts of things. But there was nothing dealing with the relationship between trauma and journalism. And through Anthony's professional experience, he became aware of that and set about doing a clinical study to determine the facts of that relationship and to describe the indices of, of PTSD among journalists repeatedly exposed to trauma. And it was a study that I was you know, happy to, to be a part of back in 1995, I guess, 99. Um, 
And it was amazing because once it had been described by a mental health professional, it became undeniable for the employers and it really did a huge amount to shift the perceptions in the journalism industry um, around the issue. Mm -hmm. And so the work was, was incredibly important. I would say the profession of journalism owes Anthony a great deal for, for doing that work because it destigmatized to a large degree all of those issues and it obliged many employers through, you know, whether it was um, duty of care or legal issues or moral issues, it obliged many employers to start taking it seriously and to start providing help to their employees who were suffering as a result of the work they were doing. And it opened up a whole conversation around mental health in journalism that previously had not existed. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, for the longest time, those conversations didn't happen. And as a result of Anthony's work, they started to happen. And now when you compare what goes on in journalism with regards to this area, it's night and day. Right. Uh, yeah, I had a question. If, if you noticed in, in your research a difference in, in the way photographers uh, who were documenting, let's say, their own struggles or their own nations or, or, or people's struggles uh, handled the trauma uh, differently than, let's say, someone who, who was flown in from an agency or whatnot, Do, is there anything that, that might come from that kind of thing? And, and, and to follow up, maybe, if, if this is true, we're seeing more photographers from the regions covering their own conflicts than we might have in the past for maybe reasons within the business or, or digital technology? So, so a few years back, UNESCO asked me to do a study looking at Mexico. And they were worried about journalists in Mexico. And um, I'll, 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 you know, I'll spare the details. It turned out to be a really difficult study to do for all sorts of reasons. But we got it done in the end by partnering. I partnered up with some Mexican journalists. And, you know, the, the difficulty that they faced was not just the threat and the danger that came with covering the drug stories, um, but the bad guys, the drug cartels, would start to target their families. Mm -hmm. um, They're ruthless. It's, the, it's yeah. as low as it gets. So they would target their, their partners, their children, their parents, their in-laws, and that's what got to the journalists more than anything. Um, and there was no escape from that because they were living in this country. They couldn't just pack up and leave. Mm -hmm. And so that was an extraordinary level of stress. There were some journalists who became almost like internal exiles within Mexico that they had to leave their region that they lived in to go and live in another part of the country to escape this, but they couldn't take their families with them. And so they would end up kind of, you know, commuting back to see their kids late at night mm. just because they wanted some contact with their family. And that had a devastating effect on their mental health. Mm. Um, and that turned out to be in many ways the most powerful variable of all uh, in terms of what was triggering their reactions was not so much their personal fear but the fear of what would happen to their families and their loved ones. And of course the cartels in a very perverse way knew this. Mm -hmm. And so I think that is a fundamental difference. And mm -hmm. if you're living in a situation like Mexico where you can't leave, it makes it so much more difficult. Mm. Saw it again when we did a study in Iran Likewise, um, the same the same kind of difficulty, in that you know the bad regimes knew how to get to the journalists, and one of the ways was to do it through their families, mm -hmm. and that pushed up their level of distress, I believe, mm. significantly, mm. Um, because then they felt guilty about it, they had no control over it, some of the journalists stopped working because of that, but remarkably many continued despite this. I mean, this was the part that just stunned me that despite this. They didn't back off. They right. they still did it. Yeah, this seems to me, in hearing you speak last night and today, the the point that you're you're getting at, which is this resilience, the fact that people keep coming back, and 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 I'm assuming what you're looking at in the positive way, the, the positive reasons are coming yeah. back. You know, but I think you know just the final point about Mexico was mm. that 25 percent of the sample that we studied had stopped mm. doing a particular story because of fear that their family were being targeted. And that raised all sorts of questions about freedom of the press because such a large chunk of individuals were not working on a particular story because of, of fear. I what think what's equally the, remarkable is that 75% of them were still know, working yeah. on it. And yeah. what about the, maybe the flip side? I was thinking of this when I asked the question, and, and I don't know if, if, if Peter Magabane is a good example necessarily, but someone who is 
who who might have drew strength from the fact that his work had an, had a personal meaning to him in the sense that he's documenting his own people's struggles and with the sense of overcoming them, and that may may give you that kind of internal strength to go forward. I, I think for him it did. Did it? Absolutely, okay. yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, very much so. Yeah. And Santiago, to, to kind of follow up on that, I mean, it, it, there are more, it seems to me, and, and you can speak to this much better, that there are, you do you contract with local journalists and local photographers more than you may have in the past, as opposed to sending someone from the States or Europe to cover it? And obviously the dangers may be greater to them because of their family and, and personal connections and relations, but... Uh, do you, do you see the same sets of, of problems and struggles that, that all journalists would face in these situations? Yeah, I mean, traditionally, journalistic organizations would send um, foreigners in to cover stories because they were trained in what the organizations needed. They knew how to operate all the equipment back in the day. And so there was a sort of um, journalistic colonialism almost um, people were being sent into countries that they might not know very well, they might not understand very well, they might not speak the language. And over time, um, probably starting in the late 1990s, early 2000s, with the sort of digital revolution and the ease of delivery of information um, through digital technology, organizations began to train local journalists how to cover stories photographers, reporters, videographers. And so now most organizations, the vast majority of people covering the world are from the countries or the regions um, where the stories are happening. And so the advantages of that are that they understand the stories better, they understand the culture and the history of the countries that they're covering. The downside, of course, is that they are living those stories every day. And so they don't have the luxury of being able to leave as a foreign correspondent might have. And, of course, they're much more vulnerable as a result of being from those countries and regions. They're much more vulnerable to pressures by, you know, power brokers, whether they're governments or criminals or military or whatever it might be. And so it's easy for those power brokers to pressure them. And the other thing that's happened, of course, is that once upon a time, it was unusual that the person in the country that you were covering would ever see the results of your work. Because if you were you know, photographing for the AP or Reuters, um, newspapers were the primary delivery of information. And so the militiaman at the checkpoint would probably never see his picture in print. Nowadays, of course, you know, with everybody having iPhones and connectivity or internet cafes or whatever it might be, chances are very good that that person is going to see um, the results of your work. And so journalism for the power brokers became more threatening and their reaction has been th more violent against the journalists. Right. Right. So in some ways, while technology has facilitated the spread of information around the world and given us deeper understanding of what's happening, it's also made the profession of journalism more dangerous, in my view. Mm -hmm. One uh, quick question also about, uh, you included in, in the book uh, Charles Porter, who <coughs> was not a photojournalist. Was, what decisions did you make to include him? And, and obviously, at least from what I read, uh, you know, the, the, the trauma and the sufferings that, that you talk a lot about in the book didn't seem to affect him. And yeah. uh, it, can you talk about that a bit? That's the exact, exact yeah. reason. I mean, yeah. so... You know, the, the first series... Um, well, let me jump in real quick. Charles Porter was a, uh, an amateur photographer who was on site during the Oklahoma City bombing. Yeah, he was a banker. Yeah. He, yeah. he worked in a bank in Oklahoma City and he mm -hmm. heard this big bang and he always kept his camera with him. I think he was a, you know, a wannabe photographer and just kind of ran outside to see where this noise had come from and he was basically the first on the scene of this, you know, the worst domestic terrorist attack in this country and took pictures and ended up winning a Pulitzer Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, for, for for one of his pictures, mm -hmm. and um, but you know he he was an interesting man because he 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 um, he liked photography, but he never had this compelling drive to do what you know what Santiago's done. Um, he he took those photographs. He on the way home from work, he stopped at Walmart and he handed in his. Is, is, is that true? Thing. Yeah. That, that, oh, yeah, he had it developed at <laughs> Walmart. And then when he came back to pick it up, someone said to him, you've got some interesting photographs here. He, had, he really had no knowledge of what he'd really done. Wow. And um, and why did you decide to include him? In first the of all, the photograph is just such an incredible photograph. Mm -hmm. 
it illustrated something that Susan Sontag said, that photography is the one art form where um, you may, for a very brief period, get by without any huge skill or training because in the luck of the moment, you get this remarkable photograph, right. and that's Charles Porter. Mm -hmm. You know, he ended up winning a Pulitzer um, for a photograph. You know, p p many great photographers have not won that. Sure. Um, and But he never had any compelling desire to go back and do it again. You know, he basically ended up, he left banking and he became a physical therapist and, you know, has a very quiet life, which is exactly what he wants. Um, and, you know, really wasn't traumatized by his work. But what was intriguing in the moment when he was on scene uh, at the destroyed building, um, he experienced two things that are really quite telling. One was um, there was no sound. For him, sound had shut off. There clearly was a lot of sound going on, hmm. but he has no memory of hearing anything. And the other thing was he had no smell. So his sensations started to change as he was taking his photographs. And that's, that phenomenon is called dissociation. You split off part of your, um, your mental functioning in response to an overwhelming event. So Charles Porter, in the moment of working, was actually to a degree dissociating. And when he came to speak about his photograph afterwards, because for a period this became a very celebrated photograph and he was on talk shows and he had this, you know, this, this, this short-term fame, whenever he went back to revisit it, he would become intensely anxious. Hmm. At the time, he didn't feel it. The dissociation, I believe, protected him in the short term, although it's a negative thing. But when he revisited it, his consciousness uh, for the moment the anxiety would come back. And he would say it was really a very uncomfortable phenomenon for him to think about it and be on, you know, on set to talk about it and feel so intensely anxious. But he didn't have any long-term uh, traumatic sequelae of things. Santiago, is that something that you can relate to? I mean, in, in, in the moment of, did, did you feel that you became so visual and the other senses were, were put in the background? Or? No, I would say some of the other senses, in fact, became um, sort of residual memories or contributed to residual memories of the experience. Smells. So the smell, in particular smell, but sound to a large degree. Mm. There are many photographers you profile in your book who, who use their grief or their guilt or their, their pain uh, and channel it into, into wonderful things, maybe in post-career. And I'm thinking of Corinne Dufka, who, who worked on you know NGOs and organizations she started, Human Rights Watch. Um, uh, Ashley Gilbertson, who did the, the series on the bedrooms of the fallen. That's um, very powerful. Is this something that, that you can comment on in terms of how... Uh, how people have used their, you know, the, their, their work and taking it to a positive place and, and ways of dealing with their own pain. Well, honestly, I think yeah. you've, got, you've, got, you've got a wonderful example uh, sitting uh, over here. Right. That, I mean, you know, um, look, at, look at Santi's career. Okay. You know, I think there's something, in my experience, a lot of people who do this line of work um, are very generous individuals. Mm -hmm. And they're generous to the point that they're often putting themselves in harm's way and sacrificing their mental health in order to tell stories, in order to show the world what's going on. And so that generosity, I think, um, carries on often. So when they stop going to war for whatever reason, you'll often find them doing things that are beneficial to individuals or society as a whole. Mm -hmm. um, performing service. Performing for service, yeah. I think there's a real service. I mean, because in some ways, this profession is a vocation. It's, yeah. it's not just a job. It's a way of life. Mm -hmm. And it's a calling. And so, you know, I think there are certain similarities between, between um, journalism and... Um, social workers or people who do good for, for societies as a whole. Mm -hmm. okay. I think a wonderful example of that is Sebastian Salgado, who, mm -hmm. you know, when he took a break from his work uh, covering migrations and he felt completely depleted by his work, physically run down, and his immune system was compromised by his exhaustion, you know, he took a break and he went back to his home in Brazil and um, the farm that he had been given by his father was you know deforested and the land was basically you know really? destroyed and he started to plant trees and um, started and you know brought back an ecosystem the most you know mm. remarkably creative uh, work and you know used nature restored nature as a way of part of his healing process as well and in my case I would say I spend a lot of time teaching mm -hmm. like I'm regularly teaching workshops and classes at the International Center of Photography here in New York and other places. 
and it's my way of giving something back to the profession that's given so much to me and helping to prepare a new generation of of photojournalists um, and helping them take stock of what it is they want to do and helping them succeed. And actually, that's perfect lead into my, my last point, which is, I, do you see that in, in the next generation coming forward and maybe with the help of books like this and, and Anthony's work and what, what your generation has seen uh, and gone through, changes that will be made in the future to make, hopefully, lessen some of the trauma we're seeing in the journalists? I don't know if we'll lessen the trauma we're seeing because, you know, it's a little bit like trying to get into a swimming pool without getting wet. You know, you're, <laughs> you're going you're gonna, to... Or at least have the training beforehand and the yeah, tools afterwards. I, to think prep, it, yeah. I think preparation is important. You see now a lot of workshops um, designed for freelance uh, journalists around safety, around uh, mental health, around first aid. Um, so I think journalists are arguably more prepared than ever to wade into world events. Um, but of course, the whole journalism world is changing and has shifted and has become more fractured and more difficult to make a living. Mm. Um, but I would say the young people that I deal with who are getting into this line of work now, um, the ones who will succeed, and it's always a small percentage, uh, are very well prepared mm. and very savvy. Last point, the changing of the, the, the nature of the business, um, There's the structures that kind of support people are not there perhaps as much as they used to be. I mean, if you have to worry about, you know, making money and having health insurance and all these other things at the same time that you're in, in a conflict zone, it would be quite Yeah, I difficult. think the, the freelance journalistic community is quite vulnerable as yeah. a result of not having the uh, backing of big organizations or limited backing from big organizations. So as a result, they have to be more self-reliant. They have to be better prepared. Yeah. And I think that's what uh, that's what we're seeing is that they're going into this with a lot more know-how than once upon a time when I started, let's say. Do you think that the number of people now who are running around with cameras and basically we all are because we have phones more people are now quote unquote photographers than ever before does that also open up the ability to find people who are willing to go in and be the next generation or is this just going to make it harder to find them because there's just so many people going click out there well, I think the nature of storytelling has changed significantly and you know pictures of people running around with guns that were a staple of uh, war photography for a long time uh, are of less interest nowadays. And what's of more interest are the sort of deeper effects on society and on, um, you know, institutions, education, uh, judiciary systems, hospitals, etc. So I see a shift in the in the storytelling focus and in the storytelling methodology. It's more complex now. Mm -hmm. To some point. degrees, yeah. uh, and so the practitioners understand that, and those are the skills that they're learning. And also, as a result of of just pure economics, you know, once upon a time it was fine if you were just a photographer. Now you're expected to be a photographer and a writer and, and an editor and, and everything. And yeah. so, you know, it's a lot more to learn. But the storytelling that's coming out of these places is is um, fantastic. And that's also due, I think, in large part to better or more diversity of the storytellers. If it's predominantly white men doing this historically, uh, now you have a much more diverse group of people, mm -hmm. uh, many more women, many more people of color. And they're, of course, able to access aspects of the story that were off limits in many cases to the traditional practitioners. Interesting point. Well, you know, we, we can go on for another few hours here, but reality dictates otherwise. Um, gentlemen, thank you both for joining us today. Uh, before we sign off, um, uh, Santiago, if people want to catch up with more of your work or where your workshops would be, um, where yeah. should they go? Uh, I'm on the adjunct faculty of the ICP here in New York, mm -hmm. um, and I'm not hard to find online if people want to reach out. Okay. Okay, and so if you're familiar Adobe, with his work, Adobe is now doing editorial and content work. And oh, I'm, yeah. I'm now at Adobe uh, exploring the photo licensing space with a focus on photojournalism and doing some cool stuff there. Okay. okay. Dr. Feinstein, what about yourself? Your books are out there, and if uh, do you have any seminars you're doing or, or if people want to see what you do and learn a bit more about what you're practicing? just read the book. Um, <laughs> By the way, I could not highly recommend it more. It is, it is a fascinating book. It's unique. It's, 
it's hard, like we said earlier, it's hard to classify. It's a very unique book and it's worth reading. And it's not, and like we said earlier, you're not going to sit down and read this in one sitting. It's a lot to take in and a lot to process. Can I say it's the, the Glitterati Editions is the publisher? Yes. And uh, I'm sure it can be found, I found it at Rizzoli last night. I'm sure it can be found at all bookstores and on the large uh, retailer that will go unnamed as the main place to get the book. Is that, okay. Shooting, right. Shooting War is the name of the Shooting book. Shooting War is, yes. And again, highly recommended. Um, if you are not a subscriber to the b h Photography Podcast, drop what you're doing right now and sign up. It is informative, entertaining, and gluten-free. Subscribe on Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, Overcast, Spotify. And you can always find us on b h Explorer website and coming soon, the b h Photography Podcast Facebook page. See, there's something to live for. For now, on behalf of Jason, John, and myself, thank you as always for tuning in today. 